said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And I think many things that we can read in the mice still rhyme to us. So it's, it's not completely accidental that this player still performs every now and then, because I think it still has things to say to us, and it's interesting to think about those things. Thank you very much. Good. Um, I'm now announcing our first speaker, Louis Borges of the uh, Université Libre de Bruxelles, who's going to take us away from the Greeks and to the time of the Roman Civil Wars. in the meantime, if anyone already has a question, you could ask it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Did uh, Camino make any counter to this? Um, well, actually, he sues Aristophanes. <laughs> uh, and he doesn't do that once or twice, because he's, he's also the target in another play. Um, uh, but the interesting thing is there are no uh, libel laws in ancient Athens. There is, in that sense, completely free speech, par parousia, as they call it. So you can call anyone whatever you like, and they can't do anything about it. But the one thing that you cannot do is insult the city. Um, and I think that might also have been the issue in, in Florian's case, the fall of Miletus. As soon as you insult the city of Athens, then you're in trouble. And that's what he gets sued for. Uh, he, he betrays the demos, the city, in an insulting way. Uh, and I think they settle out of court. So Aristotle sort of backs off. But then the year, the year after, he does another play. And it's back to his old tricks again. And Yeah, the demos is basically that is the uh, the embodiment of the polis. Yeah, the, the active citizens who get to vote, who, who do who do politics. It's all only the men uh, in, in this case, but yeah, they, they are the polis. They are the city. Yeah, uh, and it's really on what if Aristophanes insults them, uh, that is punishable. I have always issue with technology. I am an ancient historian. <laughs> so let's talk about Rome and the political leaders and the crowd during the last Roman civil war between 44 and 30 BC. We are here at the end 
of a process already sketched by Marta yesterday about populism. During the late Roman Republic, the charismatic leaders called populares pretended to care about people concerned for a better republic, but also obviously for promoting their own agenda. After Kaiser's death, at the eve of March, and the eve of March is this weekend, so it's the anniversary of Kaiser's death, we observe an increasing polarization between two prominent leaders, Octavian and Mark Anton. They influence public opinion by blaming each other for different kind of slanders, obscure and degrading origins, cruelty, cowardice, literary and oratorical incompetence, debaucheries, luxury, drunkenness, and other slanders. All these theme, themes of political invectives called vituperatio in Latin were traditional and codified. What is less traditional for this period of civil strife is that the political use of praise and blame become more systematic. On the public stage, invectives were part of both folklore, culture, and aristocratic habits. Invective could serve as a propagandist tool for the leaders, but also as an anonymous way for people to criticize them. So we are here at a great historical example. We are here at a period, a pivotal period of the history of charter assassination. Why? Because uh, it's the first time maybe in the whole history that the political power made a large scale use of political invective for achieving political goals. So what I want to focus on due to time limit is three historical cases. First, the rebuting campaign of Octavian in Campania and the machinery of Brandism. Second, the Parisian war, and third, the climax of this propaganda war between Octavian and Mark Antony. So this is the wonderful faces of our protagonists, uh, Julius Caesar, recently dead, and Octavian and Mark Antony. Uh, Marcus Aemilius Lepidus is the third wheel of the tank, so I laid him aside of my presentation. Both three, uh, the three, the three, these three guys were uh, formed a triumvirate for restoring the Res Publica. So this is the map of the Roman provinces at this time. So, Octavian, thanks to the Kaiser will, will succeed to Kaiser. Mark Antony is discarded in this succession. Charter assassination against Octavian showed that it's not worth to endorse this succession. The rivalries between Octavian and Mark Antony started with rumor about a plot. Early in October 44 BC, Antonius accused Octavian of instigating an attempt to assassinate him. Octavian returned the charge against Antony. So Octavian went to Antony's house and he displayed himself in, to the crowd in spectacle to show he is not guilty. I am a victim. I'm not guilty. And then he tried to convince the crowd by dramatization and by victimization. And victimization is often the start of manipulation of public opinion, but also in human relationship. So, Octavian, with these arguments, went to Campania and tried to convince veterans of previous civil wars to join his side. Thanks also with a lot of money, obviously. 
Octavian pursued Wobi, 3,000 veterans recently settled in Campania to protect him. He raised a private army without any legal basis. Then he marched on Rome, and at Rome he gave a speech on the forum to the crowds. And only in that moment he gave the real reason for uh, assembling his private army. It was not for protecting himself, but for fighting of Antony. But it was a total fiasco, because Antony enjoyed a great, great popularity among the soldiers. Remember, Octavian was only a child. He was only 19 years old without experience of the battlefield. It was not the case, obviously, for Antony. So this is the sum of the observation we can draw from this first event. So simultaneously to these events, some legions arrived in Brandis and Octavian was in Campania, just in that region, and he sent some agent to try to convince the new legion to join his side. He sent infiltrated agent, and he recommended them to write leaflet to convince as much as possible uh, Roman soldiers to join his side. Mark Antony uh, was the consul of that year, so he had the legal power to command these soldiers, and Octavian was uh, only a charismatic leader without uh, the support of the law. So Antony faced a position at Brandisio, and he decided to decimate the legion for restoring discipline. Only on the short term, Antony restored his authority thanks to violence, because the soldiers resented the rigorous suppression of the mutiny they uh, decided to join Octavian's side. Two legions joined Octavian's side. So I want to show you some sources that documented this event. First, Octavian instructed his agent if they could not act openly to write messages and spread them everywhere so that the soldiers could pick up the notices and read them. This is propagandistic leaflet, and it is amazing for that early time. So a good observation we can draw from this event is that the writing is not only directed to officer of military card, but to the crowd, to the whole, as much as possible soldiers he can. So the production of standardized leaflets in a quick scope of time. That fact suggests that Octavian could assemble some teams for writing this leaflet, maybe composed by uh, other uh, soldiers, uh, friends of his entourage, <coughs> or uh, slaves. And the efficacy of this strategy, because two legions join Octavian's side. So let's talk about the third example of my, uh, the second example of my presentation, the sling bullets of Perugia in 40 BC. In 42, Lepidus, Octavian, and Mark Antony form an alliance with the aims of punishing the assassins of Caesar and restoring the Republic. At Philippi, they won a great victory. Octavian returned in Italy while Antony pursued his own policy in the East. It was the first reconciliation of Octavian and Mark Antony. Octavian in Italy had to tackle the thorny issue of settling the veterans in Italy. Lucius Antonius and Fulvia, respectively Antony's brothers and Antony's wife, sustained the opposition and raised uh, an army against Octavian. At the end of the campaign, Octavian besieged them in Perugia. This event was quite exceptional. A Roman army besieged in a Roman city by another Roman army 
who also must fight with the Roman rescuing armies. So competition between the soldiers rage and reflect the rivalries between their leaders, as it is stated by the inscription on ancient leasing bullets. These bullets were inscription and slanders depicted in very vivid words. I will translate for them. So on the right side, we have, for example, Octavian, take that in your hands. Or on the other side, I want the pussy of Fulvia. Do you want more? <laughs> so, these bullets bear the names of individual commander with Sanders uh, in ash words and they reflect the violence of the invectives of this time. It's also an interesting material for gender uh, studies. But <coughs> what, what I want to focus on is the production of these standardized uh, uh, sling bullets. It's supposed a sistema di produzione seriale. So, uh, a centralization of the production, a rationalization of that production, and a standardization of that uh, production under the command, probably, of uh, Octavian himself or some uh, uh, teams of production. I disagree with the rest of it. We have also a poem written by Augustus himself. Augustus is the future Octavian, preserved by Marshall in his epigram. Because Antony felt Glaphira, a princess, Fulvia det determined to punish me by making me fuck her in turn. I fuck Fulvia. What if men respect me to sodomize him? Would I do it? I think not, if I were in my right mind. I defer me, or let us fight, says she. Ah, but my cock is dearer to me than life itself. Let the trumpet sound. It is a very nice example of Romana Simplicitas, say uh, Marshall. So simplicity in the word of expressing. So it supposed a uh, low knowledge and low literacy of the audience, but not necessarily. It is a very Roman way to express. So the medium is the message too, because the bullets represent a phallus, a penis. So what he's supposed to do with this bullet is like the, the, the stroke of a phallus, if you want. We have also a diversification of the media. We have sling bullets and we have poems that uh, uh, say the same things. So the climax of this propaganda war between Mark Octavian and Anthony, uh, between Mark Octavian and Octavian, sorry. So we have here an abstract of uh, this propaganda war. And this propaganda war was also sustained by open letters spread across Italy. It was a strong political polarization of uh, the fight. In what side we have the pure West and in the other side, we have the corrupt East, for making an allusion to the definition of Mood Cherish by my colleague uh, Martin. The, the final example I want to focus on is the opening of Mark Antony's will. It was an official document illegally sized by Octavian to show that Mark Antony wants to uh, be buried in another city than Rome. And it showed that Octavian is not a Roman anymore. So the conclusion. Octavian raised also irrational popular fear of Roman people. It was a kind of secretarian chapter assassination of that time. 
by creating an external threat. And we know that Octavian win the victory and Mark Antony and Cleopatra finish in a dramatic event immortalized by Shakespeare. So the conclusion, yeah. We can draw a spectrum of the interaction between leaders and, and crowds. But also, what a true Roman citizen is. Octavian gave the answer, and he destroyed Antony's reputation to do so. Thank you for your attention. So I think we need another minute to install uh, PowerPoint. So maybe in the meantime, uh, someone already has a question about weeks. Just a quick, quick comment, just the people write to me that this, but those cases so appear so contemporary. <laughs> Basically, just, just, just as if we're talking about this events of, of today in, in, in our country. So it means that some mechanisms uh, remain the same. Yeah. Uh, the modernity of classical antiquity is often uh, uh, a very interesting uh, topic because it teaches uh, uh, lessons, and we can uh, count this event within the eschatological fight between the West and the East, and the all uh, all a power can shape the perception of the foreigner, and it was a fight uh, of civilization against barbarism, and for example with. Uh, uh, in American imperialism, we have uh, some uh, connection to make and some analogies, but uh, we have to pay attention to not make anachronism. But the other side, we must, we don't must to underestimate also the technological means uh, of this period because they are able to reproduce a message in a quick time and on a larger scale. That's why I want to, to, to show you today. Okay, thanks very much. Um, we are up for our final presentation, which uh, is by uh, Nadja Gazani uh, of the University of Vienna. And we're going to step out of antiquity, but not completely, uh, because we're going to hear about the archaeologist Heiner Schliemann. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you for inviting me to the second uh, class uh, conference. Uh, um, I'm uh, grateful for the research perspectives that our study offers. Is this on? It's not on. regarding the figure of 19th century European-American archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann. Reputation transactions anchored in the narrative of one target figure, or even across and between target narratives, are related and come in cyclical or rather spiral form. They consist in public texts and narratives as a signifying code and code of action that are organized by personalized figurations and personal names. The term character produces this personalization or condensation. 
once created, patterns of attack and narratives of reputation enter into cycles of imitation in the sense of virality. We heard this also elsewhere. If they are negative, they seem to gain toxicity and virulence before also the internet. This much is indicated by the study of the Schliemann narrative from the 19th century to today. The means of reducing a narrative and its toxicity seems to lie in dispersal and diffusal of the personalized narrative through the affirmation instead of the processuality and relationality of agency and semiotization. For this reason, I favor the term reputation over the term character because its root already indicates the cyclical or spiral aspect of repetition with a change that is constitutive of narrative, semiotization, and medialization with a reputare from the Latin meaning to be, considered to be thing, and not just once, but continuously. So undoing character in ultimate reality, the schema narrative, narrative between archaeology and psychiatry. I would like to briefly remark because of the term automatiality and uh, the um, yeah, approach I'm taking that life narratives may come in the form, for example, of autobiography, letters, diaries, or biographies as traditional written and print media. Automediality with a wider meaning refers to any human semiotization and self creation by means of signs whether visual or oral, or also by other modalities and senses and across media. Automediality involves materiality and opacity of the media, dispersal of agency and relationality, and processuality in and of sense making. However, in the periodical reputation transaction, in, in transactions that I'm coming to, involving the figure of Heinrich Schliemann, the understanding of life writings is different. Reputation transactors use the life writings by the author Schliemann as proof and evidence of certain inborn negative character traits of a historical person and if contradictory, if they find contradictions in the life writings, they also use the life writings to, uh, to, to prove lies, you know, to argue that they are lies, rather than as signs of creative self-processing. Now, restrictions on the freedom of this self-creation, of course, apply. They depend on context and convention. Contexts where creative freedom does not apply, it would seem, are under legal oath or under critical scientific protocol or under agreement in public or private relations. So, of course, texts also can be restricted and questions of factualities arise, but principally we have to understand that there are creative self-processing especially if they come as life narratives. So the life writing in Schliemann in terms of diaries in particular, in the Schliemann nar narrative, were not produced in or for the restricted context. Still, they have been used as evidence in attacks on the person, the person before the author. To further profile uh, briefly the context, Schliemann excavated the location of ancient Troy in Anatolia in contemporary Turkey. He was one of other archaeologists from the CARP website, uh, to use a phrase from the CARP website, with a high public profile, who undertook excavations and popularized, popu publicized uh, their findings in the context and under the protocols of 19th century nationalism and imperialism. This involves much wider context that I come from. In such a discursive field, Archaeology as a science was developed between, on the one hand, classical art history that aligned with philology, and on the other hand, an approach that foregrounded material culture of societies, including so-called prehistoric non-writing communities. At the time, antiquarianism and the indifferentiated collecting, more or less indifferentiated collecting, of curious, antique, or natural objects is formed into a systematic science. Collectors and dilettante excavators readily become what are considered scientists today. So we're not yet in a yeah, somewhat hard science or in this context as today. The scientific tools in archaeology we know today, for example, in terms of the chronological dating of objects, were not yet available at all. And there was no established and critical methodology or systematics of the science or archaeology yet. This is illustrated by one example from the Shiva narrative. Narrative. These are, this is one relatively early 
um, depiction of the site, uh, yeah, floor plan, so to speak. Uh, this is a try uh, six, and the darker parts here are the so-called uh, try two, and um, <coughs> they were obviously in the stratigraphic. Uh, uh, Freeman was the first to also use stratigraphy uh, uh, depiction. Um, but the problems in interpreting the finds are seen in that um, among the strata of walled buildings that he excavated at Sisalik in Anatolia, Schliemann considered Troy II, the great, um, or here the, um, uh, the lower uh, three founded uh, ruins or, or boulders, uh, to be the Homeric Troy, while it was already clarified during his lifetime that it was actually the, uh, the younger uh, grain. Yeah? So he was off by 1,200 years. So those, these errors were, were normal at the time. That wasn't so uh, surprising. Um, so uh, now in terms of the reputation uh, transaction. The debates in the 19th century demonstrate the growth of a science and of knowledge in prehistory. In such a situation, the live attack on the reputation connected to Schliemann occurred. In the 1880s campaign, the campaign was launched and upheld by the main argument that the ruins Schliemann and his group excavated were not of the city of Troy, but of a prehistoric necropolis only. This would have been a totally different story. The debate is publicly led in printed publications such as general magazines for the Bildungsbürgertum, the educated Britain. The argument included the allegation that Schliemann had brought prehistoric finds from elsewhere to the site to forge an impression that it was a merit Troy and other such uh, discussion or debate and reading. The diction of the 1880s publications and also of their reception until today is replete with semantics of forgery, you can see this here, uh, the diction, semantics of forgery <coughs> and deceit in respect of archaeology and interpretation of excavation results. The second phase of attack of the 1980s, 100 years later and posthumous, is led in academic publications, journals, and conference papers. It starts from a return to the allegations of fraud, now fictitious distortions, lies, we have it on the right side here at the top. Um, and the uh, return to the defamation of the 1880s. <coughs> however, <coughs> however, the argument in the 1980s is then moved to psychiatry. This takes place by way of citing the life writings of the author Schliemann that didn't play a role in the 1880s. The second series of reputation transactions is hardly about archeology, span and instead about interpretation of life writings and of museality. The diction of deceit is transferred from the discourse of archeological interpretation to the medical discourse of psychiatry, or the medicinized discourse of psychiatry. The, the entire case is medicinized, becomes a matter of medicine or health, including suggestions of criminal case of 1941. So while this these transactions are of the 1980s, the psychiatric source that is drawn is of 1941, which is problematic for various reasons. Now if you look at my uh, yeah, distinctions here, what is also uh, interesting is that the second uh, round uh, at the bottom here uh, uses not the debates or, or a measure, a logical measure of disciplinary skill or knowledge in archeology, span but in addition to these scientific standards, it turns to the psychiatric or sanity argument and then involves um, yeah, suggestions of legal procedure and an appeal to common sense. I found that very interesting in relation to the question of populism. So these uh, appeals to, um, uh, in, the, in the rhetoric, what at the bottom here, what most of us would regard as, or uh, like what we would all agree on. So there's an appeal to common sense where one can see a move also into populism uh, in, in the argument. So the second series of reputation transactions involves a methodological problem in respect of sources, private letters and diaries, 
by the author Schneemann are read as factual and treated on par with scientific archaeological reports. It should be clear that Schneemann's descriptions in his private correspondence, even in creative writing exercises, cannot be legalistically taken as evidential treatments of various individuals and events, as if they were the author's statements before a jury. In other words, an approach through auto mediality and auto fiction studies is required to treat techniques of self portrayal employed in the creation of the Schneemann narrative in an appropriate way regarding the protocols of scientific discipline. Um, the matter is still ongoing. The repercussions are um, uh, still uh, happening. My presentation here is a part of them. Yeah, I'm involved in the matter. Uh, we can say that uh, the, uh, in terms of the 1880s, the defense wins, in, uh, which used a lot of uh, tools. There was a conference organized, international experts that after all agreed with Schliemann's interpretation and the attack was refuted, but there is no uh, clarification. It seems that it's rather that the attackers won in the second case in terms of the international reputation. Yes, thank you. There are quite a few contemporary repercussions, so the matter is ongoing over 130 years in all its complexity. This is a cartoon that related to actually the uh, restitution case of um, descendant of collaborators of Schliemann, also regarding property questions that of the 1990s. The, the psychopathy and pathology argument needs to be reviewed. Uh, there is in the literature also misquotation of the and misattribution of the sources. So it's all very convoluted. And what I thought was particularly interesting that with this um, psychiatric treatment of the mask of sanity, we're moving actually into the horror genre. We're moving into the genre of horror film uh, and these uh, images. Um, then the cohort discourse is also involved. There are uh, um, suggestions. This is not elaborate. And I wonder if one could find out more um, regarding yeah, competition between FRG and GDR biographers. Um, uh, there is a phrase such as Cold War psychiatric mentality and peculiarly American sensibilities that were involved that would also, in terms of the classification, the intersectionalities in the uh, um, transactions, in the reputation transactions, would require a closer analysis. And the latest development is the foregrounding of the European Ottoman Empire and European Turkish relations that are involved in the original. Uh, yeah. So um, the belligerence in the discussion and the way uh, the um, reputation transactions were talked about is already from the 1980s. The defenders actually at this, in this posthumous uh, phase uh, used the phrase psychological warfare on Heinrich Schliemann and it reflects the depiction that was used at the time. We have all the uh, criteria of um, uh, character assassination fulfilled. Intentionality, public nature, audience of perception, and character assassination. I would still, uh, and that's my <coughs> third remark, which moves a little bit away from the, from the Schliemann uh, matter. Um, I would still argue for the term that you have heard me use, reputation, transaction. I picked up the term transaction actually from uh, Sergei Stam Lenko's uh, introduction uh, because it links uh, with my uh, understanding. Um, the um, character, uh, the term character, and um, it's, uh, this is probably um, uh, in other publications, uh, Mark Tynion mentioned this, but it comes from the idea of stamping uh, an image, for instance, on a coin, right? Uh, so it's a very idea of stability. While on the other hand, coinage, and we have this, for instance, in Nietzsche, where the image is used to indicate the, uh, the, also how the, the stamp can disappear. So we, I think, need to t uh, emphasize the processual. And in the idea of uh, uh, character assassination, uh, we are, I think, hampered. And also the personalization, some simplification that happens through these personalizations uh, takes a from the processualities, the relationalities, and different agencies uh, involved. 
and the term character assassination also foregrounds these complexities with assassination coming from the Arabic, which is also being, also being discussed, uh, so that uh, the, the, um, the xenophobic is actually in the term, right? You have the European character or the term European language that is then attacked uh, by the external um, uh, source that provides the term assassin. Um, so uh, as a consequence of my reading of the Jima narrative, um, I would uh, opt for the term uh, reputation transaction. Thank you very much. So maybe you have time for one question, maybe wrap up. In some ways, the last case represents maybe a just wild comparison with Elon Musk, uh, our billionaire, just who oh, yes. is a great person, but just he's known for doing crazy things and being uh, so narcissistic. <laughs> and just maybe just just so that sort of parallels can, can be found here. That he is that he's part of Tesla. He just yeah. he is known just, just in other projects, space projects, but he also he's known for strange things, strange claims, uh, narcissistic statements. Yeah, but the question is, are they really the case in the Schumann narrative? Yeah. But I mean, Schumann is known as this, okay, this rich guy, and there is this, all this, he has this celebrity status. Um, and uh, I just I just heard a conversation with uh, conference participants. On the one hand, this, this glorified image, or this admirable image, where the concentration is perhaps on the riches, but then on the other hand, also the image of, oh, isn't he the one who, who was such a bad archeologist because he tore down Troy uh, six to get to Troy two, not noticing that Troy six was the equivalent. And in 1880s, he just didn't notice. <laughs> yeah. So the arguments, I think, are actually, to call him a narcissistic person, I think the life writings, if they're read against the grain, don't necessarily. But the character text, the character text. I think we have to leave it at that. Thanks. Yeah. 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 There are two concurrent sessions happening now. One is in this room, which is. And this is one, uh, yeah, and the one is right here. And the other one is right next to me. Yeah. This one is character assassination and strategic communication. Next door, character assassination and character Oh, well, I'll have a chair there. Yeah. <laughs> I know you. Oh, yes. I got this one. <laughs> I'll go, I'll go, not one, 13.